Hello and welcome to the weekly broadcast for the Student StarCraft AI Tournament. I am your host today, Insanity Spreader, aka Josh. Uh, this is week two of our watch of Insanity Bot playing through the Terran Brood War campaign. We are on missions three and four today. Missions three and four are two build missions uh, where we'll really get to see the full extent of Insanity Bot's playstyle on bigger maps with more bountiful enemies uh, and with a wider variety of upgrades as well as unit composition. So we'll go ahead and start with uh, mission three here. So mission three is actually the first mission I coded for uh, in this campaign mission, which is kind of funny because it proved to be a very complicated one because at the very start of the map, you don't actually own any units on the field. Instead, Duran is dropped off here, and then after a certain amount of time, all of these units are rescued and transferred ownership to you. So there was a lot of finagling that needed to be done to uh, initialize Insanity Bot, because there are a lot of things that I was able to make assumptions about for like multi, uh, normal one-on-one -on -one multiplayer games. Like it was, you can always rightfully assume that you're going to start a multiplayer game with a command center and four SCVs. So there was code involved that just assumed you would have that. And so I would always know information like where's my main base, what would be my natural expansion, uh, and those kind of things were calculated at the very get-go. But for a map like this, where we don't have any units, those kind of assumptions would lead to issues. So this required me to kind of take a different approach to how Insanity Bot was initializing. So instead of, you know, grabbing this information on the start of the game, I instead had to initialize everything that was absolutely necessary, like the map analyzer, uh, base locations, that kind of thing. But for Insanity Bot's own, like, main base position and information that it needs to know like where to build structures and where to prioritize uh, defenses and that kind of thing had to be delayed until we actually were given ownership of a base. It, it sounds simple but it, it proved to be a little problematic and required uh, a lot of finagling to get right. Uh, but we got there in the end. Uh, the funny thing is our start position, our quote unquote start position for the white Terran on this map is actually on this little island in this corner. This is technically where we start. Uh, so you can't really rely on, you know, the normal functions to like get start locations and match those up with bases that you own to kind of figure out where you start because that just doesn't work here. So mission three, uh, this is a predominantly Terran versus Zerg mission. We are given a nice base here, plenty of space, uh, low on minerals, which is unfortunate because both this base here and this corner base that we will expand to here in a little bit uh, don't have a lot of mineral patches. So it's a little slow to get the ball rolling because Insanity Bot's kind of expecting to have greater income than it actually does. And that's another instance of making assumptions about multiplayer maps that doesn't translate quite one-to-one -one over to a campaign mission. Because the campaign missions will have a varying amount of resources at your starting position. Sometimes they give you a lot, sometimes they only give you a couple. So uh, it leads to things like the build orders looking a little slow or like a little too over eager to build production when we honestly don't have the resource income to keep up with it. But we'll make do and, and we'll get there in the end. So we start off here, focus on trying to saturate up our minerals, get gas going. Uh, we're going to primarily use bio for this mission. So we will rely on marine medics as our main fighting force. And this mission is uh, honestly one of my favorites of this campaign to play personally. It The whole idea is there are four Zerg hives around the map. Uh, each color coded. So there's this purple hive, there's this red hive, there's an orange hive, and there is a brown hive here. And each base kind of has a theme going on, where you have brown, which uses like basic units like zerglings and hydralisks to come and attack you. There are a couple of mutalisks mixed in, but it mostly relies on those uh, zerglings and hydralisks. You have purple, 
which is on an island, it its position is inaccessible by the ground. So you have to either you know use siege tanks to shell the hive from the low ground, which is really easy, or use drop ships to get your combat units up here. There's red, which is, utilizes kind of late game units. It uses defilers and ultralisks and has a lot of strong anti-ground defense. And then there's orange, which has a lot of late game air units like guardians and some mutalisks. Uh, and it has heavy anti-air defense. So this match, uh, it's, it's honestly a lot of fun to play through. The Zerg harasses you from all sides. You know, you gotta stay on your toes as you build up and move out around the map. It was extra fun to program Insanity Bot to do this um, because there were certain things like the purple base that required a little bit more of a specialized solution for. If you really want to talk about, you know, an easy way to clear this map, there are certain strategies that make this map pretty trivial. Like, for example, you can stick a bunker, I believe, right here. And it, with marine range, it has just enough to hit the side of this hive. So, you know, the marines will take out this spore colony, it'll take out this uh, evolution chamber, and then it barely tickles the side of this hive and you're able to kill it really easily with just one bunker full of units. And then I believe you can do a similar thing here. Like, I, believe, I think you can place a bunker down here and just hit the bottom side of this hive. Or like I said before, you can just build a siege tank or two and kill it that way uh, as long as you have like you know marines and medics on hand to deal with the mutalisks that'll come try to kill you like you'll be able to kill this base really easily uh, orange proves to be no real threat as they don't have a sufficient number of guardians to really effectively fight off a ball of marine medic uh, and red looks really scary with their ultralists and their uh, defilers as they actively make use of dark swarm but they don't have any upgrades really going for them. So the Ultralisks don't have like really any armor. So they're still pretty easy for Marines to shred through. Oh, this is interesting. It's like the Hunter Squad's getting a little lost at where it is. I don't know why they're all wandering around like that. That's interesting. Little odd behaviors you'll see from time to time. So yeah, we're just working on building up here. You can see he's come over and he's taken this base. You'll see on the mini-map a lot of green dots kind of moving back and forth between our main base and this expansion. Um, and that's due to Insanity Bot will grab a worker and tell it, hey, let's come over here and let's build a structure. You know, let's build a command center, let's build the refinery. And so it'll grab what it thinks is the closest worker you know, distance-wise to this location, uh, and then it'll tell it to go there, but the ground distance to actually tran uh, travel between our main base and this natural base is extremely long, because you have to come all the way over here, up this ramp, around the outside, and then down this ramp. So what Insane Bot ends up behaving like is he will grab a worker, tell him to come over here and build a structure, and then when that worker is about like halfway there, Insane Bot will run through code again being like, hey, why didn't the structure build? We better grab another worker and send him over to make sure it gets built. And that's that can be optimized away if I was better about assigning workers to jobs and then keeping track of those assignments. But as of right now, Insanity Bot just kind of selects a worker, throws him out into the void, and then checks back later to see if the structure is built. Uh, and it doesn't really know where the worker is, if it's in transit, if it's stuck, anything like that. Uh, so that that's another instance where if I had more development time and a clear idea of how to accomplish that, uh, I could clean up this kind of behavior of sending workers over to build structures that are already you know, built or uh, that need a new builder to actually come and do it. So, but yeah, well, our natural here is getting defended up with some turrets which will help against purple's mutalisks we have our defensive squad running from threat to threat and this is another mission where it really the randomness of 
the attack waves and timings and stuff comes into play because you can get it after playing through this mission a lot you can get a general sense of okay brown usually sends an attack wave around this time but the direction at which brown will attack you will vary because you know the brown can come down and hit this bunker here brown can come from above it can on occasion come over and attack your newly constructed base over here uh so you're the bot really has to be able to adapt to a variety of different attack angles and defend them accordingly which fortunately insanity bot came built in with that logic from the multiplayer scene where you know people can hit you from all sorts of directions with mutalisks and so fortunately insanity bot already had that logic built into him to deal with these kind of threats so he's able to handle this very well because you know purple will come from the left side they can hit you over these cliffs over here they can come into your production they can come to this bunker directly uh, so this mission really kind of highlights the flexible defensive play style that bio can offer where marines and medics can move very quickly around and deal with things as they happen so that's always good and and it it works for me because uh, tvz is personally my favorite matchup i think it's the most interesting playing as Terran to compete against Zerg. Uh, I really enjoy Bio as a play style, so Zerg is pretty much the only matchup that really lends itself to that style past the early game. So we've hit a fair number of Marines here. We're continuing to build up our production. Uh, we're working on upgrades. Uh, you can see he keeps trying to build his science facility, but Marines keep getting in the way. So once we hit just over two full squads of Marines, we'll begin to move out and clear the map. And while that's happening, you'll see that we're going to build up a force of about three dropships. And these dropships will be specifically for specialized units to come and kill Purple. Because as I said, Purple is on an island, so it can't be killed through the conventional means of our bio squads is running around. So instead, what we're going to do is we're going to build three dropships. We're going to load them up with seven Marines and one Medic apiece. And we're going to send them up to drop up here and walk over and kill Purple. Once the Marines are on the ground with a little bit of Medic support, it's really pretty easy to steamroll over Purple. Most of Purple's defenses are uh, centralized around the Hive itself. Uh, I, found, <laughs> I found this out because... Uh, my initial strategy was to drop three dropships worth of marine medic directly onto the hive, but that proved too uh, inconsistent with its results. So instead, we come over to this right side of this upper base uh, where there are no defenders immediately to make the drop and then just walk over. And that proved to be far more effective as he kills purple pretty much the first time he goes and attacks it. So you can see Hunter 1-1 is out on the field. He's going to push into Brown. So this match, or this map, much like the first map, and Sandy Bot prioritizes killing enemy structures that are close to its main. Uh, and this kind of led to an interesting behavior because there is like this invisible circle around Sandy Bot's base where the distance values flip so I and I have yet to really dig in and figure out why this is but I believe it's because the information is held or is being processed as an integer so the distance between let's say this hive and my main base is calculated in pixels so the number of pixels between my command center and this hive is held within an integer and the problem with an integer is it only goes up to a certain a uh, certain number, I think it's, what is it, 2.6 billion or something to that extent? 2.6 million? I can't remember off the top of my head, but, um, so this is close enough, but once the buildings pass about anything to the right of this extractor, the distance in pixels is too far to be calculated in pixels and, and again saying this out loud like i i'm not 100 percent sure because like 2.6 million pixels seems like a lot 
uh, <laughs> but this is my best guess as far as what's going wrong. Because you'll you'll notice in Sanity Bot, anytime this extractor is built or anything to the right of this extractor is built, he will come over and he will kill it. But then he will move on to other buildings on the map. And like I said, I think that's because these structures are technically in the positive for distance. And then anything to the right of that is flipped because it overloads and now it is a negative number so when it looks at what's the closest building anything with a negative number is like oh that is immediately the closest building because you know negative is less than a positive number so it's kind of funny though uh, and i didn't really uh spend any time kind of like fixing this behavior uh because he still goes out and he clears the map just fine it just leads to a funny behavior where he'll come into here he will bully brown into submission until it has like nothing left and then leave and then occasionally we'll scan and see if brown has built any new buildings and then it'll immediately go back bully it again and then leave uh so again i could clean up that behavior but he's just still able to uh, clean up the map just fine so he's moving into orange right now he should push all the way in kill the hive and then leave uh we losing an occasional marine to these guardians but like i said they don't have a, a large enough number to really contest a concentrated bio bomb so we'll just lose like one at a time but it's not enough to stem the tide all right you can see those three drop ships are almost loaded we're just waiting on another medic to be built before these are sent off. So Insanity Bot had drop logic before uh, building it for this campaign, but the Insanity Bot on the ladder does not have the ability to run multiple drop ships. So the multiple drop ships was, in addition, I had to come up with for this campaign, which was relatively uh, straightforward in theory, but, but, but in execution turned out to be a little more difficult to expound that out to giving commands to multiple dropships at once and do it in a relatively intelligent manner. We're still waiting on that medic to be built. I wonder, oh, it's because, so yeah, the defensive squad got triggered because something flew into range of the main base. So Insanity Bot's prioritizing filling up the defensive squad before it worries about finishing off the uh, dropship. So yeah, we came in, we killed Orange, we're going to move on to Red now. Occasionally, like I said, we'll scan into Brown, see that it's built something new, and go bully it into submission again. Here are the Ultralisks. Uh, again, very scary, and yeah, with Dark Swarm especially. But fortunately with some Science Vessels, and enough marine blood will be able to push in and make some progress. Yeah, the the red bot, uh, the red zerg, I should say, its performance really varies on how well it uses dark swarm, because there are occasions where it puts down really good swarms that just keeps wiping squads off, and Zanibot doesn't quite know yet how to kind of back off and play around uh, dark swarm. Usually in multiplayer matches, uh, his performance he either wins or is already lost before Dark Swarm really hits the field. So it hasn't been something that I've really put any, any time into playing around. There are, you know, more optimizations that need to be had with him playing around things like Lurkers, uh, better Mewless defense, that kind of thing before you know we really can get to that late game. So we got to do early things better before we can really work on that late game stuff. So that's why you'll see him in this, uh, on this mission, kind of just stand in the middle of Dark Swarm and not really worry about it. Now I'm really curious as to why he still hasn't filled up this last dropship. Because I feel like he should have already. Oh, this could be because, oh, no, there it goes. All right. I was going to say, because I did have a problem where he wasn't properly removing dead Marines from the drop squad before the drop was happening. 
So I was thinking maybe the medic got killed and it wasn't properly deleting that from the you know drop squad list. So it thought it had all of its units even though it didn't. But no, we got there just fine. So the drop squad's here. Uh, we're gonna make real short work of these defenders. Again, purples. Most of its units are clustered over here, and then it kind of just strings them over to our units, and we're able to, you know, kill them just fine before they can really do any damage to our squad. In the meantime, we've expanded here to the center. Another small amount of mineral fields. This mineral field at the back is actually inaccessible, so there are six mineral fields here, but effectively there's only five because you can't actually get to this one before you know, one of these is mined away. Drop squads moving forward, losing a few marines to sunken colonies. It should be fine though. We should have enough to kill the hive. Oh, Brown came up to help. That's not something you see often. It is a funny behavior you'll you'll see. Uh, specifically, I usually see Red will do this. Red will come up, drop off like an Ultralis or a couple of uh, Zerglings to come try to kill these units up here, but for the most part, I'm, I've never seen Brown actually try to assist in the defense. Ultralis getting killed by the defensive squad here that's assigned to this base. Uh, now our units have seen that this extractor exists, so we're going to move over to try to kill you know, these, these structures again, but most likely Brown will die last. So. We'll come over, kill this extractor, then most likely we'll move back up to try to take care of Red. You may see if we reach the point uh, where our natural base runs too low, we'll actually come and take a base here. The terrain analyzer thinks this is the base, not, not here, so we might expand out this way. But our hunter units are on the prowl. Our production is coming off of five bases. We'll start really dipping into more science vessels, which is really going to help because red doesn't really have a way to kill air units. It has like a couple of hydralists in the back, but for the most part our science vessels are really uh, unthreatened. So the more science vessels we get, the easier red will be to conquer because we'll be able to irradiate more and more of their Ultralists before the fight starts and the Defilers themselves. So, I'm saying it's a little lost at the moment. It's probably because it saw this extractor being built. But this should clear up. It, it's most likely trying to keep its squads together, but because there's so many, they're getting stuck on one another. But this should clear up as soon as we hit close to that max supply. We will kind of... Uh, forego keeping the squads together in favor of just moving units across the map. Again, this is another thing where Insane Bot typically doesn't have 200-200 supply of bio versus zerg. So if we do, most likely reason is because we're stuck on a ramp somewhere. So when we hit close to that max supply, don't worry about trying to keep the marines and medics together. Instead, just run us across the field. We'll replace any, you know, any losses. But yeah, we'll come down here probably just kill this extractor again. Uh, we may push a little far enough forward to kill the hive, but we'll see. Most of the squad's moving away. These three might stay and kill the hive, we'll see. They'll kill this spore colony for sure. Unupgraded Ultralis will start melting uh, to our 3-3 marines with Sten. Oh, this might be bad though. Yep, okay, that Ultralis gets under Dark Storm, which is unfortunate. They're gonna get a lot of kills unless our science vessels come up to assist. Alright, these three Marines look like they're gonna actually finish the job this time, which is, which is good for us, as it'll cut down the amount of times so we have to walk back down here to kill a few structures. Vessels flying in, irradiating the Ultralis under Swarm. The irradiate's kind of a double-edged sword, as it does do area damage versus bio. So the Ultralisk will do a lot of damage to the units around it with irradiate, 
but we'd much rather kill the ultra list than let it just kill everything under dark swarm so we're willing to take that you know that kind of damage but yeah like i said the unupgraded ultra lists uh while scary aren't really a threat to our upgraded bio ball all right so we got a defensive squad coming down here to help defend this outpost uh they might just stand in the way and prevent its construction which is ironic but yeah the main force is moving in uh we've dipped kind of low enough where we may start caring about squads sticking together and building up but we'll see all right brown is officially taken care of so that just leaves red which red has a few sunken colonies that are proving to be a challenge, but for the most part they are running out of units, so. And they don't have enough hatcheries to really, you know, gather back up. Oh, the Marines will run, or the medics will run forward and blind every single overlord in sight. <laughs> so, so that's the thing, uh, it's Avot uses optical flare on anything that's a detector. That's primarily for uh, my base strategy versus Zerg includes the use of ghosts and nuclear missiles. So the idea is a lot of Zergs like to sit behind a wall of sunken colonies and rely on those while, they're, while their mutilists are out on the map, you know, causing havoc on the Terran base. So the concept of my Terran versus Zerg build is to have medics use the optical flare to blind any overlords that are near by, and then have a ghost cloak and launch a nuke to destroy the defensives, uh, and then my bio moves in after the nuke falls. That's the concept behind the build order I use. Uh, it doesn't always work as planned, but it works well enough where that's the primary strategy that Insaniabot relies on. Our vessel count has grown quite large. Uh, I believe Insaniabot's limited to I want to say 12 it's somewhere between 12 and 16 vessels usually he doesn't get that many because bots on the ladder are fairly good about uh, trying to clear out vessels and my vessels don't have a lot of defensive logic to kind of dodge scourge and things like that but now that red is officially dead we've moved on to the last portion of the mission which is really simple we just have to move Duran up to this circle. Now this caused a little bit of problems on its own because when Duran enters this circle, the circle is destroyed and for some reason the Brood War API really doesn't like when these neutral units are blown up in this manner. So I had to implement a pause into Insanity Bot so whenever a mission is about to be complete for a lot of these missions it usually ends with us entering a circle or destroying a neutral structure. And when that happens, Insanity Bot will pause all of its actions so its units will, you know, complete whatever their last command was. But then Insanity Bot won't run any more commands on anything and will instead just have like a, 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 a script to complete the mission. Like that one, it ceased all actions. All Insanity Bot was doing was scanning that top area to give vision and then moving Duran to that circle. And because if we were still taking actions it would cause a crash because like i said the that circle disappearing causes a lot of problems so you'll see that a couple of times throughout these playthroughs of insanity bot pausing everything and waiting for the mission to finish just to avoid uh, those crashes so that was mission three complete uh went rather well didn't have any major hiccups so now we'll move on to mission four so mission four is a tvt we're going up against a red and a blue Terran. This one uh, is unique in the fact that we have an option to complete one of two objectives. So we can either come to this top right corner and we can kill the physics facilities, which allow a Terran to build battle cruisers, or we can come to the bottom right and we can destroy covert ops facilities, which allows Terrans to build ghosts and nuclear missiles. So whatever you destroy on this mission will not be part of the mission after, at least in theory. Uh, initially when I played this campaign through, uh, I thought that if I destroyed the covert ops facilities on this mission, that the next mission I wouldn't have to deal with ghosts at all. 
which was really uh, a really appealing idea for me because I hated the lockdown ability because I would have these intricately set out bunkers and siege tanks and then these ghosts would just walk in and lock down the siege tank and that was really annoying. So I usually would destroy the covert ops facilities, but then I was alarmed to find that the next mission, the enemy AI still had ghosts that used the lockdown ability. They just didn't have the ability to launch nuclear missiles. So on the flip side, if you destroy the physics facilities, the next mission won't have battle cruisers at all, which is a far better trade. Because while nukes may be scary, the next mission doesn't actually launch that many nukes at you past the beginning section. So to, uh, Insanity Bot here is going to up, go up and destroy the physics facilities because having to deal with the occasional ghost is far easier for the bot to handle than having to deal with battle cruisers flying in at random angles. So you can see here we've expanded up to this nice little natural position. Our squads will come and position themselves here. Uh, this is a behavior because the squad typically tries to position itself bet halfway between where the bunker is and where its base is. And that just happens to be this little choke point here. This isn't ideal as it would probably be far better served to have them sit somewhere like here where they can protect from attacks coming from below towards the uh, natural base and be at a short distance to this ramp to get down to the main base. But attacks rarely come at our natural, so I just kind of left it here as it wasn't really worth my time to fix, as it wasn't really posing a problem. Our defensive squad's able to move down easy enough where it's not a big issue. So this mission, fortunately, we have a large mineral field to, or a large amount of minerals in this field to harvest from. So we'll be able to harvest from all of these and really get going, as well as a fair number up here. Two geysers right off the bat really helps fuel our um, our mech strategy. So the challenge of this mission is we get attacked a lot. Like I said, there's both a red Terran above us and a blue Terran below us. And they are fairly active on the map. They'll hit us quite often. So usually it's just a matter of holding off the opponent's aggression long enough to build up a sizable number of siege tanks and vultures and goliaths before we move out towards our objective in the top right corner. Uh, as I said, we're not really in any danger of losing this mission, but we can get set back a long way. Uh, usually red will hit us from this top side with a, a sizable amount of like marines and a couple of goliaths or so, and they can kill quite a number of SCVs. Oh, yeah. Speak of the devil. So our SCVs will come up, try to defend themselves while they buy time for the defensive squad. They do a, a fairly decent job at defending, as they are fairly tanky, do 5 damage and attack. But yeah, we lose a couple, but we'll be able to resupply easy enough. Our natural is up and running. And we're just going to focus on saturation. We'll start adding on production facilities. And then once we have built all of the SCVs we want, we'll really have the ability to start churning out mech like there's no tomorrow. Now the unfortunate part of this mission is while we do have a sizable area to build in, uh, Terran structures are extremely bulky. So being able to fit in enough supply depots into this area to really you know, hit 200 supply uh, will mean that this area will rapidly fill up with structures. Uh, occasionally we'll build over here, but that's kind of secondary and saying about trying to stack structures on top of each other in an intelligent way. And because of the initial layout, that just kind of leads to a lot, a chunk of supply depots down here, a chunk of supply depots that kind of stretch up from here, and then a bunch of factories just kind of slapped over on this side. And eventually it'll look like a mess and units will have a, a, a real difficult time moving through it, but no one gets stuck completely as we're eventually able to work through it so while it's not 
an ideal layout that we're going to end up having. Uh, again, this is another instance of it works well enough where it wasn't worth my time to kind of streamline it. So adding on an additional factory as our SCV count continues to climb. We'll, uh, and like I said, we're going to really build up these supply depots going up this way. The annoying thing is there is actually a position of three siege tanks from red, like roughly in this area of the darkness, which means any unit that tries to path between our main base using this direction towards our natural is going to get killed by these siege tanks. They're just kind of there. Enemy attack coming in. Our defensive squad's moving down. We shouldn't lose either of these structures, as there's just two fire bats, two marines, and a vulture, so it's not like they're really going to kill any of our structures extremely quickly, at least not fast enough to avoid our defensive squad coming down and cleaning them up. Uh, these are the <laughs> these are the annoying ones, so blue has a wealth of ghosts that they will use liberally, so you'll see... Usually there'll be like a hit squad of like five ghosts that will come in and they'll try to lock down everything in sight. Usually they'll prioritize locking down the siege tanks, but they'll lock down vultures, they'll lock down your SCVs as they're mining. They're just obnoxious to deal with. So in Sanibot, when it's getting ready to move out, it has this behavior where it'll kind of move down towards this river shoreline this tar river and then it gets really hung up in this area because its siege tanks will come here and they'll see like oh there are hostiles across this this chasm here and so it'll siege up and it'll start shelling the side of the river and then they typically get stuck there because blue actively tries to rebuild those structures while the tanks are still there so the tanks uh, as I mentioned in the first video, have that timer that's continuously going, telling them to stay sieged. And that timer keeps getting reset because they'll send in like an SCV or uh, they'll build structure or like send in a, a random unit. So our, our you'll see our mech at some point will start getting hung up here, but eventually they'll be able to clear out and move up towards our objective, which is just up here. Oh, yeah, those are the, that's that siege line I mentioned. So if he tries to transfer workers going this way, these will shell it. There could be an easy fix of um, providing an initial objective of my mechanized force to come like to this position first before pushing over to the right. But again, like he, it's say about doesn't transfer workers nearly enough this way to warrant doing that, as it would take more time. So we just kind of left it as is. Adding in two armories so we can double spin upgrades, as we'll have plenty of gas and we will have the mineral income to do so without issue. We're continuing to tack on factories. We've got a starport to add on a couple of science vessels, which will be nice to, defect, uh, to, to detect spider mines, as well as to make use of the defensive matrix ability. We have these two wraiths here, but in Sanibot, doesn't have code currently implemented to deal with wraiths, so these just kind of sit as like passive guardians. Uh, they'll probably eventually get killed by blue, especially because shelling across the river usually aggravates blue to come try to attack us, so we'll, we might see a large influx of attackers come in here now that we've got a tank actively shelling across the river. Oh, here's one now. Yeah, this is why, as a player myself, I thought it was going to be better to destroy the Covert Ops facilities for this kind of situation. That's extremely annoying to deal with. But between our defensive squad moving down, our production actively popping out fresh combat units, we should be able to defend this. We're at a slight upgrade disadvantage as they have plus one attack, and we are still working on plus one. Actually, we just finished. Oh, we might lose the science facility, which would be unfortunate, but we should rebuild that. 
We already have a Science Vessel in production. Yeah, so blue is really pressing in because they do not like us destroying their structures. We have a Wraith tickling the Siege Tank. Oh, losing this with the upgrade going would be very unfortunate. But these two tanks are low enough, this race should be able to finish off that tank. And then we'll rebuild what was lost. I, I'm not sure actually if Insanity Bot still has an armory, if it'll rebuild the second armory. That might be something that needs looking into. So we'll see. This Wraith is earning its keep. It'll probably die to these two Marines because Wraiths don't do any damage and they're very, very vulnerable to anything that shoots up. Oh, we have a Vulture there. I can't believe that's on range. That's unfortunate. That Siege Tank certainly believes he's in range. Oh, man, he's in range to hit down here, but he's not in range to hit here. That doesn't make sense to me. Red's gonna come in here. Uh, blue will continue to kind of funnel units this way as we shell across this river. But, like I said, we're, our production is good enough now where we're able to deal with pretty much anything that is being sent our way. Goliaths attacking our refinery up here, which hopefully they start attacking SCVs enough where they'll dance just far enough forward to get hit by this bunker. This bunker probably would be better placed up here, but I did want it back away to avoid getting shelled by siege tanks without them being visible. So. We might lose this refinery eventually, but we'll rebuild that just fine, and the bunker here is not going to fall to three goliaths when they inevitably step too far forward. Dropship's coming in. We should be rebuilding our science facility here soon. as we are waiting on the science facility to continue our upgrades. Our defensive squad keeps getting pulled in separate directions. Unfortunately, most of the Goliaths are dealt with. We've lost a number of SCVs, seven kills on this client, which is certainly not ideal. But all our units are too busy all meshing down here to really deal with threats effectively. So yeah, we shelled everything within sight. They'll keep trying to rebuild this refinery. The tanks will keep killing it. But we're at the point now where Insanity Bot's gonna begin to trickle its units up to this top right and deal with the actual objective. Alright, there's our science facility. Plus two weapon upgrades are underway. Which is the most important upgrade for us to get, because once we get plus two, we'll be able to deal with the Red Terran's defensive positions a lot better. They have a lot of siege tanks placed in good positions, so it'll require a little bit of a little bit of intelligence. Ah, uh, this is an unfortunate placement. Yeah, if he tries to put anything here, it's gonna get attacked by this. Fortify position up here. Our tower of supply depots continues to expand. We're almost at 200 supply though, so we'll stop constructing the tower and instead everything will go into maintaining our production. We might expand here. Uh, usually we can finish this mission before our main starts running out, but if we do need to expand, there's a very convenient place over here that we can go to. And it's relatively easy for us to clear out. There's just a bunker, a couple of goliaths, uh, and this has plenty of minerals where we're able to finish the mission w without any concerns. Working our way over, we might hit that switch that'll flip where all of the Goliaths and Vultures will cut their ties to their squads and head directly for the objective. As I said, we keep getting hung up over here on this ledge. If that tether gets cut, all of these units will go up to fight in the north. Goliath 
the last supply depot getting built. Yeah, there are a few positions of high ground for these siege tanks that make pushing rather difficult as they do quite a bit of damage and are unseen until we get some vision. But again, in the end we'll be able to push through just fine. We currently have five factories. If we expand again, we will go up to seven factories. And that's just behavior from the ladder itself. Insane about likes to stay on five factory while it's maintaining two bases. It doesn't expect to have this level of, you know, mineral income. Uh oh. Getting some attacks into the natural. This is unfortunate, but again, this is setbacks. We have enough where we'll probably be able to finish this mission without too much effort, but this each tank's going to rack up a lot of kills. Lockdown proving to continue to be a nuisance. We may end up expanding here, especially if we lose our natural. And this is the thing where, because we don't have any squads over here gathering up to, like, full strength, um, all of our squads are out on the field. We're just actively refueling them as we're going because we're at such high supply that we're not really dealing with this threat over here. Which, again, is uh, not an optimized decision, but this is proving the the vast the vast gap of growth that insanity bot really needs to be uh, fully competitive in the online scene uh, there are, I, I formally believe insanity bot has a, a good foundation of mechanics as far as you know building placement resource management all that good stuff but for unit micro and decision making there's a lot of work left to be done Unfortunately, our main push is going much better than the small force just actively destroying our natural. We've hit that max supply amount where our units are going to stop being careful and rush forward to try to do as much damage as possible. This will be good as it'll clear out a lot of the smaller units and will give our seat tanks more room to move forward. Our floating buildings will come forward, trying to get more vision. Unfortunately, Missile Turret are taking shots at it. Twenty-five kills on the siege. <laughs> but yeah, we're nearly at the end here. So even if we do like run out of SCVs, run out of money, we have enough uh, offensive units on the field to finish this mission really without issue. And the opponents will have to kill our entire base before they're able to, you know, defeat us. Which should be extremely difficult for them to accomplish before we finish the mission. Those last few high ground siege chains get taken care of. Now that we've kind of fallen in supply, we're back to that uh, squad logic of moving in, in line with one another. So the progress will slow a little bit as the siege tanks continue to creep forward. 31 kills on this, 24 on this marine. That's pretty nuts. But yeah, everybody back home is just focused on pushing towards the front line. Oh, the marine got dealt with. So now there's just the siege tank with 35 kills. But we are actively hitting the physics labs now, so. Ghost down here tickling a structure. So, all in all, not the greatest showing of Insanity Bot's logical powers, but. He's able to complete the mission all the same. This is 
certainly not the longest mission, but one of the longer ones, as it does take us a while to really get uh, our foothold moving up north. And because of the vast amount of attack paths between, you know, red coming in and blue coming in. Oh, that was a juicy mine hit. Love to see it. And this is where the occasional mine within our labyrinth of structures comes in handy. Oh. I see these coming over because the opponents got a little bit too close to the mineral line. But fortunately we've left a nice trail of spider mines to really deal with them. There's only two physics facilities left, so we're nearly there. Siege tanks up to 55 kills. <laughs> that's, very, that's very unfortunate. <laughs> Alright, so we just have to step forward a little bit more, kill that physics facility, and then we are done. Which is good, because we've hit the point where we're pretty much out of money. Because we've uh, not been smart about our defense. But hey, we uh, we finished the mission, <laughs> so that's all that matters. All right, well that was mission four complete. So we'll just have a little dialogue sequence here, and then we are on to mission five and six next week. So I thank you again very much for tuning in. I hope my dialogue was a little bit interesting for those two missions. Uh, we still have a lot of really fun things to come with the remainder of the Terran campaign. A lot of interesting stuff that went into the last four, equally as much so with the first four. So I, if you enjoyed, please consider coming back and viewing some more. And again, if you're looking for more uh, bots playing against one another, I encourage you to check out the Twitch channel for the Student Starcraft AI tournament, or come on down to the Discord. Uh, we're always welcoming to new people, new folks interested in programming bots and competing in Starcraft or just questions in general, we're happy to have them. So thank you very much for your time, and I hope you have a wonderful day.